the epistle of Barnabas. Greetings to you, my sons and my daughters, in the name of the Lord who loved us. Peace. Rich and eminent indeed are the evidences of holiness with which God has endowed you, and such a root has his gift of spiritual grace taken in your hearts that I am overjoyed by the bliss and glory of your souls. It deepens the happiness of my own hopes of salvation when I see such an outpouring of the Spirit upon you from the riches of the divine fountainhead. After longing so much for a sight of you, the reality has left me overwhelmed. One thing at least I know I am, and am deeply conscious of in my own mind. Since I last spoke to you, there is a great deal that I have come to understand. For on the way of righteousness I have had the companionship of the Lord. Consequently, I too, like him, am bound to think of you as dearer to me than life itself, because of the intense faith and love that have their dwelling in your hearts, as you hope for that life which is his. Also, I have a feeling that if my care on your behalf prompts me to pass on some part of what I myself have received, it may earn me a reward for being of service to souls of such merit. For these reasons, I have been at pains to send you this small treatise, by which, in addition to your faith, you may be put in complete possession of knowledge as well. The principles of the Lord are three in number. Faith begins and ends with hope, hope of life. Judgment begins and ends with holiness, and the works of holiness are evidenced by love and the joy and gladness it brings. Moreover, through the prophets, the Master has laid open to us both past and present history and has given us an anticipatory taste of the future as well. It follows that when we see events coming to pass, step by step, precisely as he told us, this ought to enrich and heighten the reverential fear we pay to him. So what I propose to do, not as a teacher, but as one of yourselves, is to put a few thoughts before you that should bring comfort to your hearts in the situation we are now facing. For these are evil days, with a worker of evil himself and the ascendant, and this means that we must apply ourselves to a careful study of the divine ordinances, having patience and the fear of God to reinforce our faith, and resignation and self-discipline for allies. Provided we keep firm hold on these, in a spirit of holiness, in all matters that have to do with the Lord, then wisdom, intelligence, understanding, and enlightenment will gladly come to keep them company. Now what the Lord has made abundantly clear to us by the mouths of all his prophets is that sacrifices, burnt offerings, and oblations are things of which he has not the smallest need. His own words are, What do I care about all these sacrifices of yours, says the Lord? I am satiated with burnt offerings. I want neither fat of lambs, blood of bulls or goats, nor your own attendants here in my sight. Never again are you to come trampling my courts. It is useless to proffer me gifts of fine flour. Incense is detestable to me, and I cannot endure your new moons and your Sabbaths. All these things he swept away, intending the new law of our Lord Jesus Christ to impose no yoke of coercion, and its oblation to be no offering of human hands. And in another place he says to them, When your fathers came out of the land of Egypt, did I ever tell them to offer me burnt offerings and sacrifices? Never. All I told them was, None of you is to harbor an evil thought in his heart against a neighbor, or any tenderness for broken vows. Now unless we are altogether without understanding, we ought surely to detect our Father's kindly purpose for ourselves in this. For it is to us that he is speaking here. In his desire that we should discover the right way of approaching him, instead of going astray as they did, and what he tells us is the sacrifice for the Lord is a contrite heart. A heart that glorifies its maker is a sweet savor to the Lord. It behooves us, my brothers, to inquire very closely into this matter of our salvation. For fear the evil one should insinuate his wicked wiles into our hearts and manage to cast us out from the life that lies before us. In this connection he also says to them, Why are you keeping a fast? so that my ears are being assailed this day with the whining of your voices. This is no fast of my appointing, says the Lord, not this humiliation of a man's soul. You may twist your necks into hoops and wear sackcloth and put down ashes and to lie on, but you shall not call this an acceptable fast. And then addressing ourselves, he goes on, Look, 
The fast of my choice is this. Relax all your iniquitous restrictions. Loosen the shackles of your oppressive covenants. Let your ruined debtors go free, and tear up all your unjust agreements. Break up your bread into portions for the starving, and if you see a man who is in want of clothing, fit him out yourself. Bring in the homeless under your own roof, and should you happen to catch sight of some person of low degree, be sure that neither you nor anyone belonging to you casts an eye of scorn upon him. Then shall your light shine out like the rising sun, healing shall dawn swiftly upon you, and you will march forward with holiness as your vanguard and the glory of God on either flank. Then God will hear you when you call, and while the words are still on your lips, he will say, Look, here I am. If only you will forswear imprisonings and violence. Leave off your resentful murmurings. Give your bread to the hungry with a good grace, and have pity on the soul that is afflicted. Thus, my brothers, patiently looking ahead to the day when a people prepared in his beloved should hold the faith in its perfect purity, he made all of these things clear beforehand for us, so that we should not be wrecked on the reefs of adherence to their law. What we must do, then, is to survey the present situation in all its aspects, and see which of them offers assurance of salvation for us. Let us keep ourselves with the utmost strictness from any kind of wrongdoing, otherwise wrongdoing will get the better of us. Let there be hatred in us for the errors of this world, so that there may be love for us in the world to come. We must not give such rein to our natural instincts that we feel ourselves free to mix with all the rogues and sinners, or we shall only grow to resemble them ourselves. The last great hindrance of all is now at hand, which according to Enoch is described in Scripture. For the Lord has made an end of times and days, so that his beloved can come quickly and enter upon his inheritance. The prophet speaks to this effect. Ten kingdoms will reign over the earth, and after that a petty king will arise and bring down three of those kings at once. On the same subject, Daniel has a similar thought. I saw the fourth beast, which was evil and powerful and more savage than all the other creatures in the ocean, and I saw how ten horns sprang out of it, and then out of them sprang a smaller horn, a kind of offshoot, and it subdued three of the larger horns at once. It is for you to think out the interpretation of this. There is another piece of advice which I would urge on you, speaking as one of your own kind, who loves each and every one of you more than his own life. And that, and that is, that in the present circumstances, you should take serious thought for yourselves, and not copy certain individuals by exaggerating your own sins and claiming that our covenant abides for us. Indeed, it is ours. For Moses had hardly received it when they, the Jews, forfeited it forever. What scripture tells us is, Moses was in the mount forty days and forty nights fasting, and he received the covenant from the Lord, tables of stone written upon by the finger of the Lord. But because they then turned aside after idols, they lost it. The Lord's words were, Moses, Moses, make haste and get down, for the people you brought out of Egypt have broken my law. Moses understood and threw down the two tables he was holding, and the covenant of theirs was smashed to pieces, so that the seal of the covenant of Jesus, the Beloved, might be stamped on our own hearts, together with the hope that accompanies faith in him. There is a great deal I should like to say here, not as a teacher, but simply as one whose love for you feels it wrong to leave out anything that is within our grasp. But this letter is being written in haste, in my humble devotion to you, Accordingly, let us be specially wary in these final days, for all our years of past of faith will do no good to us now if the lawless times in the, and in the face of the many trials that lie ahead of us we fail to offer such resistance as becomes God's children to the insidious infiltration of the Dark One. We must set our faces against any unprofitable trifling and have a rooted aversion to the way of wickedness and its works. All the same, you are not to withdraw into yourselves and live in solitude, as though God had already pronounced you holy. Come and take your full share in the meetings, and in deliberating for the common good. Scripture says, Woe betide those who are wise in their own eyes, and knowledgeable in their own Let us be men of the Spirit, then. Let us make ourselves into a real temple of God. So far as lies in us, let us devote ourselves to practicing the fear of God, and trying earnestly to keep His commandments. 
and in his ordinances will be our delight. For when the Lord judges the world, there is going to be no partiality. Everyone will be recompensed in proportion to what he has done. If he is a good man, his righteousness will make the way smooth before him. But if he is a bad man, the wages of his wickedness will be waiting to confront him. So no assumption that we are among the called must ever tempt us to relax our efforts or fall asleep in our sins. Otherwise, the prince of evil will obtain control over us and oust us from the kingdom of the Lord. Moreover, there is this to bear in mind, my brothers. When you see that even after such great signs and wonders have been wrought in Israel, they were nonetheless rejected. Let us be very careful not to be found among those of whom it is written that many are called, but few are chosen. Now when the Lord resigned himself to deliver his body to destruction, the aim he had in view was to sanctify us by the remission of our sins, which is effected by the sprinkling of his blood. For what scripture says of him, referring partly to Israel, but also partly to ourselves, is, He was wounded on account of our transgressions, and bruised because of our sins, and by his scars we are healed. He was led to the slaughter like a sheep, and like a lamb that is dumb before its shearer. How deep should it be our gratitude to the Lord, who thus gives us an insight into the past, as well as wisdom for the present, and even a measure of understanding of the future. Not without justice, truly, as scripture says, are the nets spread for the birds, implying that ruin justly awaits a man if, when the way of holiness is known to him, he nevertheless turns his steps into the way of darkness. The next point, my brothers, is this. Granted that the Lord was ready to undergo suffering in his concern for our life, yet he is, after all, the Lord of all the earth, to whom at the foundations of the world God had addressed the words, Let us make man in our image and likeness. In that case, how could he possibly bring himself to suffer at the hands of men? Listen, and you shall hear. The prophets, graciously inspired by himself, had been foretelling him in their prophecies, and since it was essential for him, if he were indeed to destroy death and prove that the dead can rise again, to make an appearance in human flesh. He, accordingly, allowed himself to suffer. By so doing, he would be able both to fulfill the promises that had been made to our ancestors and to establish a new people for himself, and also to make it clear during his presence on earth that it was his intention to raise mankind from the dead and afterwards to judge them. Besides, by his teachings to the people of Israel and his working of miracles and wonders, he was making known his message and the infinite depths of his love. But it was in his choice of the apostles who were to preach his gospel that he truly showed himself the Son of God. For those men were ruffians of the deepest dye, which proved that he came not to call saints, but sinners. Furthermore, supposing that he had not come in the flesh, how could it then have been possible for men ever to look on him and be saved? For even when they behold the Son, though it is but his own handiwork, and must one day cease to exist, they cannot look directly into its beams. The incarnation of the Son was intended to bring ahead to a head the sins of the people who had persecuted and slain his prophets, and for this purpose he allowed himself to suffer. For God lays the bruising of his flesh at their door with the words, When they buffet their own shepherd, the sheep of the flock shall perish. Even the actual form of his passion he willingly embraced, since the word of prophecy had doomed him to meet his death on a tree. Spare my life from the sword, it said, and then pierce my body with nails, for the congregation of the wicked have risen up against me. And again it says, See, I have tendered my back to scourgings and my cheeks to blows, and I have set my face as firm as a rock. Moreover, after he had done as it was commanded him, what does he say then? Who presumes to accuse me? Let him stand up to face me. Who seeks a verdict against me? Let him approach the presence of the Lord's servant. Woe betide you. You shall all wear out like a garment, and the moth shall eat you away. In another place, the same prophet, viewing him as some great strong block of marble laid ready for the trimming, says, Look, I will lay a stone of great price in the foundations of Zion, a choice and precious cornerstone. And how does he go on? Whoever believes in it will have eternal life. Are we really to pin our hopes on a stone then? Of course.
course not. What is signified is the enduring strength with which the Lord has endued his human body. He has set me, he says, like a solid block of stone. Elsewhere, too, the prophet says, the stone which the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, adding, this is the great and wonderful day which the Lord has made. I am writing very simply out of my humble devotion to you, so that you may understand. And what does he say further? A gathering of wicked men surrounded me. They came about me like bees round a honeycomb, and also they cast lots for my garment, it being his destiny to appear and to suffer in human flesh. This is the way his passion was revealed beforehand. And the prophet says of Israel, Woe to their souls! They have planned a wicked scheme to their own hurt, saying, Let us bind the just one in fetters, for he is a vexation to us. Again, what has that other prophet Moses said to them? Look, this is what the Lord God says. Enter into the good land which the Lord vowed he would give to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Take it for your inheritance. It is a land flowing with milk and honey. Now let me show you what true insight can tell us about that. What it is in fact saying is, Put your hopes in that Joshua, who shall be shown to you in mortal guise. For here in the land that poor suffering creature which stands for man, since it was out of the earth that the shaping of Adam was wrought, what then is signified by a land that is good and flowing with milk and honey? Blessings on the Lord, my brothers, for vouchsafing to us wisdom and the discernment of his secrets. The prophet is saying in a divine figure here, though only a sagacious and instructed lover of the Lord would understand it. Well, when he turned us into new men by the remission of our sins, it made us into men of a wholly different stamp, having so completely the souls of little children that it seemed as though he had created us all over again. It is with reference to our refashioning that scripture makes him say to his son, Let us make man in our own image and likeness, and let him rule over the beasts of the earth and the fowls of the air and the fishes of the sea, adding, as he contemplated the fair beauty of our fashioning, increase and multiply and fill the earth. He was speaking then to his son, but let me point out how he also speaks to ourselves. Having indeed brought about a second creation in these last days, the Lord says, Behold, I am now making the last things, even as I made the first. So this is what the prophet was referring to when he proclaimed, Enter into a land flowing with milk and honey, and rule over it. For you and I, you see, have actually been made completely new creatures. As he says in yet another of the prophets, Behold, says the Lord, I will take the stony hearts out of this people, the people, that is, who were already foreseen by the Spirit, and put hearts of flesh into them, which he says because he was going to appear in flesh himself, and make his dwelling among us. Hence, my brothers, this poor habitation of our hearts is a shrine of holiness to the Lord. And, and moreover, the Lord says, Where shall I appear before the Lord my God and be glorified? And the reply is, In the assembly of my brethren I will make confession to you, in the midst of the assembled people of God, I will sing hymns to you. It is we ourselves, then, who are the people he has brought into that good land. And what does the milk and honey signify? Well, a child's life begins first of all on honey, and then goes on afterwards to milk. And in the same way, after we have entered into life through belief in the promise and through the word, shall then go on to live and become rulers of the earth. As he said above, let them increase and multiply and rule over the fishes. Is there anyone today, though, with this power to rule the beasts and the fishes and fowls of the air? No, for we have to realize that ruling requires authority. If it is to issue commands and exercise dominion, and at present this is not the case. However, he has told us when it will be so, namely when we have been made sufficiently perfect to become the inheritors of the Lord's Bear in mind, then, O children of joy, that there is not a single thing which the Lord in his goodness has not made clear to us beforehand, so that we may know to whom all our thanks and praises are due. Though the Son of God was the divine Lord and the future judge of living and dead alike, yet nevertheless he suffered in order that his affliction might win life for us. So we have to accept the fact that if it had not been on our behalf, it would have been impossible for the Son of God to experience suffering. 
You may ask next why he was given vinegar and gall to drink at his crucifixion. Here then how there had already been a prefiguring of this in the case of the temple priesthood. The scriptural precept was, Whoever fails to keep the fast shall die the death which was a commandment given by the Lord in reference to the fact that in time to come he would be sacrificing the vessel of his spirit for our sins, whereby the type he created in Isaac when he was sacrificed on the altar would find its fulfillment. And what does it say in the prophet? Let them eat of the goat which is offered for the sins at the fast. And note this carefully, let all the priests but nobody else eat of its inward parts, unwashed and with vinegar. Why was this? Because when I am about to offer my body for the sins of this new people of mine, you will be giving me gall and vinegar to drink. That is why you shall be the only ones to eat, while the people of Israel are fasting and lamenting in sackcloth and ashes. In this way he indicated his predestined sufferings at their hands. Notice the directions he gave. Take a couple of goats, unblemished and well matched, bring them for an offering, and let the priests take one of them for a burnt offering. And what are they to do with the other? The other, he declares, is accursed. Now, see how plainly the type of Jesus appears. Spit on it, all of you. Thrust your goats into it. Wreathe its head with scarlet wool, and let it be driven out into the desert. This is done, and the goat word leads the animal into the desert. And there he takes off the wool and leaves it there. On the bush he call, we call a bramble, the plant we usually eat the berries of if we come across it in the countryside. Nothing has such tasty fruit as a bramble. Now, what does that signify? Notice that first the goat is for the altar, and the other is accursed, and that is, it is the accursed one that wears the wreath. That is because they shall see him on that day clad to the ankles in his red woolen robe, and will say, Is not this whom we once crucified and mocked and pierced and spat upon? Yes, this is the man who told us that he was the Son of God. But how will he resemble the goat? The point of there being two similar goats, both of them fair and alike, is that they see him coming on the day. They are going to be struck with terror at the manifest parallel between him and the goat. In this ordinance, then, you are to see typified the future sufferings of Jesus. But why should they put wool on the thorns? This, too, is a type of Jesus, meant for the church's instruction. It, for if one wanted to take the scarlet wool for himself, it would cost him much suffering since the thorns were fearsome and could only be mastered with anguish. Similarly, says he, those who would behold me and possess my kingdom must go through affliction and suffering before they can reach me. What now do you suppose is the significance of his next direction to Israel? Men whose sins had come to a head were to bring a heifer for an offering and to slay it and burn it. Then, after gathering up the ashes and putting them into vases, Young children were to tie scarlet wool on branches of wood. Here again, you see, we have the scarlet wool and the type of the cross, together with the sprigs of hyssop, and with these the people were to be sprinkled, man by man, by the youngsters, to cleanse them from their sins. See how clearly he is speaking to you here. The calf is Jesus, and the sinners who offer it are those who dragged him to the slaughter. After that, we hear no more of the men, or of the glory in store for sinners. The children with the sprinklers are our own gospel preachers of sin forgiven and hearts made clean, to whom he gave authority to proclaim the good news, and of whom, as a token of the tribes, there were a dozen, because the tribes of Israel were twelve. And why were there a trio of boys to do the sprinkling? That was in memory of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and their greatness in the sight of God. And why was the wool put on wood? Because the royal realm of Jesus is found on a tree, and they who hope in him shall have eternal life. And why hyssop as well as wool? Because in his reign there will be days that are evil and corrupt, through which we shall come to our salvation, and also because slime of hyssop is a remedy for bodily aches and pains. To ourselves it is plain enough that these were true reasons for doing things in this way. But to them it was all dark, because their ears were deaf to the voice of the Lord. He has something to say, in fact, in another place about those ears when he speaks of his circumcising of our hearts. In the prophet the Lord says, As soon as their ears heard of me, they obeyed me. And again, they that are far off shall hear with their ears, and know what I have done. And be circumcised in your hearts, says the Lord. Again, he says, 
Hear, O Israel, these are the words of the Lord your God. And again, the Spirit of the Lord proclaims, Who is he that desires to live forever? Let his ears be open to the voice of my servant. Once more he says, Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken this for a testimony. He also says, Hear the word of the Lord, you princes of this people. And yet again, he says, Hear, my children, the voice of one crying in the wilderness. In short, he circumcised our ears, so that we might hear his word and believe. The particular form of circumcision in which they put their trust, however, has been completely set aside, for he has declared that circumcision is not a physical thing. That is where they went wrong, because they had been misled by an evil angel. God's actual words to them were, Thus says the Lord your God, This is where I find his commandment. Do not plant your seed among thorns, but be circumcised for the Lord. What is his meaning? Why circumcise the hardness of your hearts, and do not be so stiff-necked? Or again, take this. See, he says the Lord, All those nations are uncircumcised in their foreskins, but this people is uncircumcised in its heart. You will say, but surely this people received physical circumcision as the seal of their covenant. Why, every Syrian and every Arab is physically circumcised, and so are the idol priests. But does that make them members of the Jews' covenant? Even the very Egyptians practiced physical circumcision. Dear children of love, here is the full explanation of it all. Circumcision was given to us in the first place by Abraham, but he, when he circumcised himself, did so in a spiritual prevision of Jesus. He got his instruction from three letters of the alphabet. But the scripture tells us that out of his own household, Abraham circumcised 18 and 300. How does this spiritual intuition come into this? Well, notice how he, it specifies the 18 first, and then, separately from this, the 300. Now, in writing 18, the 10 is expressed by the letter I and the 8 by E. And there, you see, you have I-E. S-U-S. And then, since grace was come to by a cross, of which T is the shape, it adds, and then 300. Thus it indicates Jesus with two letters, and the cross with the third. All this is perfectly well known to him who has graciously planted the seeds of his teaching in our hearts, and a better interpretation than this I have never given to anybody. I am persuaded, though, that you have every right to know it. And now for that saying of Moses. You are not to eat of swine, nor yet of eagle, hawk, or crow, nor of any fish that has got, not got scales. In this there are three distinct moral precepts which he had received and understood. For God says in Deuteronomy, I will make a covenant with this people that will embody my rules for holiness. So you see, the divine command is in no sense a literal ban on eating. And Moses was speaking spiritually. The meaning of his allusion to swine is this. What he is really saying is, you are not to consort with that class of people who are like swine, inasmuch as they forget all about the Lord while they are living in affluence, but remember him when they are in want, just as swine, so long as it is eating, ignores its master, but starts to squeal the moment it feels hungry, and then falls silent again when it is given food. Next you shall eat neither eagle nor hawk, kite nor crow, this means that you are not to frequent the company or imitate the habits of those who have no idea of earning their own bread by toil and sweat, but in total disregard of all law swoop down on the possessions of other people, going about with every appearance of innocence, but keeping a sharp lookout and darting glances in every direction to see whom their rapacity can prey upon. In the same way, the birds he speaks of are the only ones that do not provide their own food, Sitting indolently on their perches, they watch for an opportunity to devour the flesh of other creatures and make themselves thoroughgoing pests by their graceless ways. When he says you are not to eat of the lamprey, the polypus, or the cuttlefish, his meaning is that you are not to consort with or imitate the kind of people who have rejected God altogether and are already living under sentence of death, just as it is those fish and no others which are doomed to swim far down in the lowest depths of the ocean, never breaking surface like the rest, but making their homes underground at the bottom of the sea. In these dietary laws, then, Moses was taking three moral maxims and expounding them spiritually, though the Jews, with their carnal instincts, took him to be referring literally to foodstuffs. David, too, had been given understanding of the same three principles, 
but how he expressed them is, Blessed is the man who has not followed the counsel of the godless, like the fishes who take their way in darkness down to the depths below, nor taken his stand in the path of sinners, like those who indulge their swinish sins behind a God-fearing appearance, and has not sat in the seat of the predators, like the birds that sit waiting for their prey. See, so now you have the whole truth about these alimentary precepts. Moses did say, however, that you may eat anything that has cloven hooves and chews the cud. Why does he say this? Because when a creature of that kind is given provender, it shows its recognition of the giver and takes an evident pleasure in him while it is refreshing himself. So Moses, contemplating what the Lord required, gave it to this apt turn of expression. For what those words of his mean is, Seek the company of men who fear the Lord, who muse in their hearts on the purport of every word they have received, who take the statutes to the Lord on their lips and observe them, who know that meditation is a delight, who do in fact chew the cud of the Lord's word, and the cloven hoof, that means that a good man is at one and the same time walking on this present world and also anticipating the holiness of eternity. So you see what a master of law giving Moses was. His own people did not see or understand these things. How could they? But we understand his directions rightly and interpret them as the Lord intended. Indeed, it was to aid our comprehension of them that he circumcised our ears and our hearts. Now, let us see if the Lord had been at any pains to give us a foreshadowing of the waters of baptism and of the cross. Regarding the former, we have the evidence of scripture that Israel would refuse to accept the washing which confers revision of sins, and would set up a substitute of their own instead. Be astonished, you heavens, says the prophet, and let the earth shudder more and more at the two wicked things the people has done, for they have turned their backs on me, the fountain of life and they have dug a well of doom for themselves. Is Sinai, my holy mountain, a rock that has been deserted then? As a bird's fledgling shall you be, which go fluttering hither and thither when they are bereft of their proper nest. And again the prophet says, I will go on before you, leveling mountains, shattering gates of brass, and sundering bolts of iron, and I will give you treasures that are mysterious, secret, and unseen, so that you may know me for the Lord God. Also you shall dwell in, in a rocky fastness where there are springs of never failing water. And your eyes shall see the king in glory, and your heart shall ponder the fear of the Lord. And in another prophet he says, He that does these things shall be like a tree planted where the streams divide, with fruit springing forth in its season, and leaves that never fade. And all his doings shall prosper, not so with the godless. No, they shall be like the dust that is swept from the face of the earth by the gales. Therefore the godless shall not be able to stand at the judgment, nor sinners in the counsel of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of righteous, but the way of the godless shall be utterly destroyed. Observe there how he describes both the water and the cross in the same figure. His meaning is, Blessed are those who go down into the water with their hopes set on the cross. In speaking of their reward in its season, he means to say, I will pay it in time to come. But in the meanwhile, leaves that never fade means that every word your lips utter in faith and love will open the gate of conversion and hope to many. Another of the prophets also says, The land of Jacob was extolled above all the earth, which signifies that he raises to glory the earth and vessel that contains his spirit. What more does he say? There was a river issuing from the right hand, with fair young trees rising out of it, and whoever eats of them shall have life forevermore. Here he is saying that after we have stepped down into the water, burdened with sin and defilement, we come up out of it in full fruitage, with reverence in our hearts and the hope of Jesus in our souls. And whoever eats of them shall have life forevermore means that he who hears these sayings and believes will live forever. He also gives us an outline of the cross in another of the prophets who says, When shall the consummation of all this be accomplished, says the Lord, when a tree droops and then rises up again, and when blood drips from a tree? Here you have an allusion to both the cross and to its future victim. And in another place, when the Israelites were being assailed by the neighboring tribesmen, there is this command he gave to Moses for the purpose of reminding those under attack that their own sins were responsible for the loss of their lives. 
that when the Spirit, speaking inwardly to Moses, prompted him to make a representation of the cross in him who was to suffer on it, which was his way of intimating that unless they come to put their hopes in him, the hostilities against them will never cease. So Moses made a pile of shields, one upon another, in the midst of the fray, and taking his stand there, high above all the rest, he spread his two arms out wide, and Israel thereupon began to regain the victory. But every time he let them drop, death became their master again. Why was this? To make them see that their salvation must depend upon putting their trust in him. Thus he says in another of the prophets, All day long I stretched out my hands to a faithless people, and one that rejects my righteous way. And there was also another occasion on which Moses made a symbol of Jesus. It was to show how Jesus is ordained to suffer and to give life to men, even those who believed they had destroyed him on the cross. This to a sign took place at a time when there was heavy mortality among the Israelites, for in order to convince them that the result of their sinning must be to bring them into the bitterness of death, the Lord had caused them to be fatally bitten by all manner of serpents, it having been through a serpent that sin first came into the world, in the person of Eve. So even though Moses had personally given them the command, You shall have no image, whether cast or carved, for your God, yet now, to show them a symbol of Jesus, he constructed one himself. Moses made a serpent out of brass, set it up in a conspicuous position, and issued a proclamation summoning the people. When they came flocking together, entreating Moses to intercede for their healing, he told them, Whenever one of you is bitten, let him approach the serpent on the pole, in a spirit of hope. Believing that even it is with, though it is without life itself, it has nevertheless power to impart life, and he will recover at once. And this is what they did. Here again you see the glory of Jesus. For there is nothing which is not found in him, and nothing which does not point to him. And a further point, what is it that Moses said to Jesus ben Nabe, that prophetic figure whom he so names for the sole purpose of letting the whole people know that the Father reveals to us every detail that bears upon his Son. When Moses sent this Jesus ben Nave to spy out the land, he said, addressing him by that name, Take a scroll in your hand, and note down this word from the Lord, that in the last day the Son of God will destroy the whole house of Amalek, root and branch. There again you see is Jesus, not as the Son of Man, but as the Son of God, though here appearing in a type in human form, and because in after times they will assert that Christ is the Son of David. David himself is inspired to say, in fear and understanding of this error of sinful men, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit here on my right hand until I make your enemies a cushion to put your feet on. There is likewise the saying of Isaiah, the Lord said to my anointed Lord, I have taken hold of his right hand for nations to bow down in submission before him, and I will break down the might of kings. Notice how David calls him Lord. He does not call him son. Let us see now whether it is our own people or the earlier folk that are the true inheritors, and whether the covenant is meant for us or for them. Listen to what scripture has to say about the people. Isaac entreated the Lord for his wife Rebekah because she was barren, and she conceived. Then Rebekah went to inquire of the Lord, and the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples in your bowels, and one people shall be stronger than the other people, and the elder shall be servant to the younger. Now then, it is for you to realize who Isaac is, and who Rebekah is, and to which of the people this prophecy of the superiority of one to the other refers. The language of Jacob in another prophecy is even plainer. When he says to his son Joseph, Behold, the Lord has not bereaved me of your presence. Fetch me your sons, that I may give them my blessing. Joseph fetched Ephraim and Manasseh, and since he wanted the blessing for Manasseh, as the elder of the two, he led them to the right hand of his father Jacob. But Jacob, with the eye of the Spirit, could perceive the people of the future. And so what does it say? Jacob changed his hands across, laying his right hand on the head of Ephraim, the second, and the younger son he gave the blessing to him. And Joseph said to Jacob, Not so, put your right hand on Manasseh's head. It is he that is my firstborn. But Jacob told Joseph, I know, child, I know, but the elder must serve the younger, though this one shall have a blessing too. So you can see who is meant by his decree that this people shall have the primacy and inherit the covenant. 
And if, in addition to all this, we find further confirmation of it in the life of Abraham, it puts the final touch to our knowledge. For what was it that he said to Abraham, when he was acquainted, accounted righteous for being the only believer? See, Abraham, I have appointed you to be the ancestor of Gentile nations who believe in God, but without being circumcised. Very well, then. Now let us see whether the covenant which he vowed to the patriarchs to give to the people was in fact so given. It was, it was to be sure, but their sins disqualified them for the possession of it. Moses, the prophet, tells us, spent forty days and forty nights fasting on Mount Sinai to get the Lord's covenant for the people. And Moses received the two tablets from the Lord, written in the Spirit by the finger of the Lord's hand. Moses took these and was carrying them down to give to the people. When the Lord said to Moses, 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 make haste and get down, for the people you brought out of Egypt have been breaking my law. And Moses perceived that they were making molten images for themselves again, and he threw away the tablets out of his hand, and the tablets of the Lord's covenant were broken in pieces. So although it was indeed given to Moses, they themselves lost their right to it. Mark now how it came to belong to us. Moses was given it as a servant, but it was the Lord himself who conferred it on us, making us the people of the inheritance by his sufferings on our behalf. Though the purpose of the Incarnation was partly to allow them to put the final seal on their sins, it was also that we might receive the covenant of the Lord Jesus from its rightful heir. It was this for which he had been ordained, by manifesting himself in person, to redeem from the murk of darkness our hearts, so long wasted by death, and abandoned to the mischief of error, and to establish a covenant among us by his word. For scripture tells us how the Father had charged him to ransom us from the darkness, and create a holy people for himself. I, the Lord your God, have called you in righteousness. The prophet says, I will hold your hand and strengthen you, and I have appointed you to make a covenant with the people, and to be a light to the nations, to open the eyes of the blind, to loose the captives from their chains, and to free those that sit in darkness from their prison house. That is how we know the plight from which we have been redeemed. Again, the prophet says, Behold, I have appointed you to be a light unto the nations, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. Thus says the Lord God, who redeemed you. The prophet also says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has appointed, anointed me to preach glad tidings of grace to the lowly. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted to proclaim deliverance to prisoners and recovery of sight to the blind, to announce a year of divine favor and a day of recompense, and to comfort all that mourn. Next, about the Sabbath. In the Decalogue, when God spoke to Moses face to face on Mount Sinai, we read, Also keep the Lord's Sabbath holy, with clean hands and a pure heart. And in another place it says, If my sons keep the Sabbath, I will show mercy upon them, now, what is said at the very beginning of creation about the Sabbath is this. In six days God created the works of his hands, and finished them on the seventh day, and he rested on that day and sanctified it. Notice particularly, my children, the significance of he finished them in six days. What that means is that he is going to bring the world to an end in six thousand years, since with him one day means a thousand years. Witness his own saying. Behold, the day of the Lord shall be as a thousand years. Therefore, my children, in six days, six thousand years, that is, there is going to be an end of everything. After that, he rested on the seventh day, indicates that when his son returns, he will put an end to the years of the lawless one, pass sentence on the godless, transform the sun, the moon, and stars, and then on the seventh day enter into his true rest. But you shall keep it holy, says he, with clean hands and a pure heart. We are very much mistaken if there is anybody at the present time with a heart pure enough to keep holy the day which God has sanctified. Observe, though, that a time is coming when we shall indeed rest and keep it holy, though not until our final justification has enabled us to do so, that is, when the promise has at last become ours, when inquiry is no more, and when the Lord has made all things new. Then we shall be able to keep it holy, because we ourselves will have been made holy first. He also tells them, I have no patience with your new moons and Sabbaths. You can see what he is saying there. It is not these Sabbaths of the present age that I find acceptable, but the one of my own appointment, the one that, after I have set all things at rest, is to usher in the eighth day, the commencement of a new world, 
and we too rejoice in celebrating the eighth day because that was when Jesus rose from the dead and showed himself again and ascended into heaven. We now come to the matter of the temple and I will show you how mistaken these miserable folk were in pinning their hopes to the building itself as if that were the home of God instead of to God their own creator. Indeed, they were scarcely less misguided than the heathen in the way that they ascribed divine holiness to their temple. For mark how completely the words of the Lord himself dispense with it. Who is it who can span the whole heaven with the breadth of one hand, or the earth with the flat of his palm? Is it not I, says the Lord? The heaven is a throne for me, and the earth is stool for my feet. What sort of house, then, will you build for me? And where is the spot that can serve me for a resting place? You can see their hope was the purest folly. Besides, he also says, Behold, those who pulled the temple down shall rebuild it, and the very thing which is actually in process of fulfillment now. For after their armed rebellion it was demolished by their enemies, and now they themselves are about to build it up again, as subjects of their foemen. All the same, it has been revealed that the city, temple, and Jewish people are all alike doomed to perish one day. For scripture says, It will come to pass in the last days that the Lord will deliver up to destruction the sheep of the pasture with their sheepfold and their watchtower, and for the Lord to say a thing is for that thing to come about. But what we have to ask next is, can there be any such thing as a temple of God at all? To be sure there can, but where he himself tells us that he is building it and perfecting it. For it is written, When the week draws to its close, then a temple of God will be built gloriously in the name of the Lord. And from this I must infer that there is indeed such a thing as a temple, only mark that it is to be built in the name of the Lord. From the days before we believed in God, our hearts were a rotten, shaky abode, and the temple only true, too, too truly built with hands, since by our persistent opposition to God we had made them into a chamber of idolatry and a home for demons. Now it will be built in the name of the Lord, Make sure, too, that this temple of the Lord shall be built gloriously, and listen in the way in which this can be done. When we were granted remission of our sins, and put our hopes in his name, we, made, we were made new men, created all over again from the beginning. And as a consequence of that, God is at this moment actually dwelling within us in that poor habitation of ours. How so? Why, in the message of his faith, and in the call of his promise, in the wisdom of the statutes and the precepts of his teaching, in his own very presence inwardly inspiring us, and dwelling within us, in his unlocking of the temple doors of our lips, and his gift to us of repentance. It is by these ways that he admits us, the bondsmen of mortality, into the temple that is immortal. For when a man is on earnestly bent on salvation, his eyes are not on his fellow man but on the one who is dwelling in that person and speaking through him. And he is full of wonder that never till now has he heard such one words from him, nor known the desire of hearing them. This is what the building up of a spiritual temple of the Lord means. I hope with all my heart that so far as a simple and straightforward exposition is possible, I have at least omitted nothing that bears directly upon our salvation. For if my pen were once to start on the theme of the present era, or of those that are to come, you would never understand, for such things are veiled in the language of parable. So let this be enough. Now, let us pass on to a quite different sort of instruction and knowledge. There are two ways of teaching, and two wielders of the power, one of light and the other of darkness. Between the, those two ways there is a vast difference, because over the, over the one are posted the light-bearing angels of God, and over the other the angels of Satan, and one of these two is the Lord from all eternity to all eternity, while the other stands paramount over this age of iniquity. First then, for the way of light. And here a man who would make the pilgrimage to his appointed home must put his whole heart into his work. To aid our steps on the road, illumination has been given to us then. Love your Maker, fear your Creator, give glory to Him who redeemed you from death. Practice singleness of heart and a richness of the spirit. Shun the company of those who walk in the way of death. Abhor anything that is displeasing to God, and hold every form of hypocrisy and detestation. Be sure that you never depart from the commandments of the Lord. 
do not exaggerate your own importance, but be modest at all points, and never claim credit for yourself. Cherish no ill-natured designs upon your neighbor. Forbid yourself any appearance of presumption. Commit no fornication, adultery, or unnatural vice. Never take the word of the God upon your lips in loose company. If you have to rebuke anyone for a fault, do it without fear of favor or favor. Keep calm and mild. Reverence the words you have heard, and bear no resentment towards a brother. Neither, never be in two minds as to whether something is or is not to be. Never make free with the name of the Lord. Love your neighbor more than yourself. Never do away with an unborn child, or destroy it after its birth. Do not withhold your hand from your son or your daughter, but bring them up in the fear of God from their childhood. Do not cast covetous eyes on a neighbor's possessions. Do not be greedy for gain. Do not set your heart on being intimate with the great, but look for the company of people who are humble and virtuous. Whatever experience comes your way, accept it as a blessing, in the certainty that nothing can happen without God. Never equivocate, either in thought or speech. Obey your masters with respectfulness and fear as the representatives of God. Do not speak sharply when you are giving orders to servants, whether men or women. If their trust is in the same God as yours, else they may lose their fear of him who is over both of you. The Lord did not come to call people according to their rank. He came for those who were already prepared by the Spirit. Give your neighbor a share of all you have, and do not call anything your own. If you and he participate together in things immortal, how much more so in things that are mortal? Never be in a hurry to speak, for the tongue is a fatal snare. For your soul's sake, be as pure as you can. Do not be one of those who stretch out their hands to take, but draw back when the time comes for giving. Cherish as the apple of your eye anyone who expounds the word of the Lord to you. Day and night keep the judgment in mind. Seek the company of God's people every day, either laboring by word of mouth, that is to say, by going among them for the purposes of exhortation and striving to save souls by the power of speech, or else working with your hands to earn a ransom for your own sins. Never hesitate to give, and when you are giving, do it without grumbling. Soon you will find out who can be generous with his rewards. Keep the traditions you have received, without making any additions or deductions of your own. Never cease to detest evil. Make your decisions fairly and uprightly. Do nothing to encourage dissensions. Bring the disputants together and compose their quarrel, and make, and make confession of your own faults. You are not able to come to prayer with a bad conscience. That is the way of the way of dark, the dark Lord is devious and fraught with damnation. It is the way to eternal death and punishment. In it is found all that destroys the souls of men, idol worship, brazen self-assertion, and the arrogance of power, cant and duplicity, adultery, manslaughter and robbery, vanity, rascality, sharp practice, spitefulness and contumacy, sorcery and black magic, greed and defiance of God. They persecute the virtuous. They hate truth and love falsehood. They know nothing of the rewards of righteousness or of devotion to goodness and just judgment. The widow and the orphan are nothing to them, and their sleepless nights are spent not in fearing God, but in the pursuit of vice. Gentleness and patience are altogether alien to them. All they care for is paltry and worthless. All they look for is their own advantage. They have no pity for the poor, nor ever trouble their heads about any poor soul in distress. They are always ready with malicious rumors, for knowledge of their Creator is not in them. They make away with infants, destroying the image of God. They turn the needy from their doors and deal harshly with the afflicted, while they aid and abet the rich. They are brutal in their judgment of the poor. In a word, they are utterly and altogether sunk in sin. All this shows what a good thing it is to have learnt the precepts of the Lord, as they are set forth in Scripture, and put them into practice. For the man who does this, there will be glory in the kingdom of God. But one who prefers the other way will perish together with his works. 
To this end are the ordinances of resurrection and retribution. And here, if you will accept a hint from a well-wisher, I have an appeal to make to those of you who are in positions of influence. You have some amongst you to whom you could do good, and pray see that you do not fail them. The day is approaching when the world will share the fate of the evil one. The Lord is at hand, and his reward is with him. So once again I must urge you, be yourselves your own good lawgivers. Be yourselves your own trusty counselors, and have no more to do with the piety of hypocrites. May the God of the Lord of all the world grant you wisdom, understanding, and knowledge together with the true comprehension of his ordinances and the gift of perseverance. Take God for your teacher and study to learn what the Lord requires of you. Then do it, and you will find yourselves accepted at the day of judgment. If good deeds are ever remembered, have a thought for me and think these things over. Then my anxiety and my hours of wakefulness may at least have produced something that is good. I ask this as an act of grace from you, so long as the fair vessel of the flesh remains to you, try to leave none of these things undone. Spend continual study on them, and see that all the commandments are carried out faithfully. They are assuredly worth the pains, which is why I was the more solicitous to put my best efforts into this letter, in the hope that it might do something to improve your spirits. Farewell, my children of love and peace. May the Lord of glory and of all grace be with you.